Hello, and welcome everyone to Climate Action in a Global Landscape, a TCG virtual summit and the third event in our fall winter convening season. Uh, the theme for this convening season is crisis and transformation, and we are so grateful that you're here with us today. My name is Teresa Eyring. I'm the executive director and CEO of TCG, and I use she, her pronouns. I am currently Zooming from the unceded lands of the Lenape, colonially known as Manhattan. For people with visual and access needs, I'd like to offer a visual description. I'm a white woman with shoulder length brown hair, purple reading glasses, and a beige sweater. And I am sitting in front of a wall that has some artwork and a lovely oval mirror with gold trim. Adrian. Hi, welcome everyone. I'm Adrian Badu, TCG's Deputy Director and COO, and I use he, him pronouns. I'm so grateful you're here today amid the rush of the holidays spending time with us today for these critical conversations. For visual and access needs, I'd like to provide a visual description. I am male of Indian descent. I have short black hair with a dustin of gray, and I'm wearing a an orange t-shirt, uh, orange shirt. Uh, I'm also zoom in from the land of the Caddo, Wichita, Kawakoni, and Kickapoo peoples. We're also going to share TCG's land acknowledgement in the chat, along with ways to move from acknowledgement to action in support of native-led movements for justice, which will be a major theme of our work today. Now, before we get into this truly amazing lineup of speakers and conversations, we wanna pause for a moment of reflection. This is the last major gathering of the calendar year and what year it's been. We've been reopening our theaters amid the challenges of the Delta and new Omicron variants. And we've been doing that while also deepening our accountability to racial justice. Those efforts have been both fruitful and frustrating, but what we know for sure is this past year has changed us and we're not going back to the normal of scarcity and inequity. We have worked too hard for that. And we also know that all hard work needs to be followed by rest and reflection. That's why we've rescheduled our theater and active in summit from January to fall of next year. That will give us time to recharge our batteries and realign our efforts to truly live our new mission to lead for a just and thriving theater ecology. And a big part of that realignment process will be our re-envisioned governance ecology. We are now seeking nominations for candidates and uh, the, the task forces that we are seeking nominations for are our next generation, breaking barriers and global connectivity task forces. Um, these are three task forces of our board, which we hope you'll consider nominating yourself or someone else and we are going to share the links to the executive summary of our new strategic plan, uh, which is very exciting, as well as an FAQ page for our nomination process. We also strongly encourage you to, um, again, as I mentioned, not only submit nominations for others or for yourself, but also note that the deadline is December 17th, which is next Friday. Before we get started, we have some love and gratitude to give to our sponsors for TCG's fall and winter convening series. ALJP Consulting, Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, Howard Gilman Foundation, the Schubert Foundation, National Endowment for the Arts, New York State Council on the Arts, Fisher Dax Associates, Charcoal Blue, Threshold Acoustics, and Schuller Shook. We're also very grateful to our friends at HowlRound for live streaming this event. Yes, thank you so much to all of our funders and our sponsors and HowlRound uh, for being partners and supporting our work. Now, earlier we talked about how much has changed over this past year. And one of the most exciting changes for us has been our focus on climate action. Um, TCG has been programming climate focused sessions at our convenings for well over a decade, but this year really marked a new level of commitment. Many of you may have joined us for our first Climate Action Summit in April of this year, or perhaps participated in the climate track of our June virtual conference, 
Uh, some of you may be participants in our newly launched Climate Action Monthly meetings. Uh, I know that many of you who are here with us today have been prioritizing this work for a very long time. And for others, you've only begun to integrate climate action into your work as a theater maker. Just wanna tell you that wherever you are on that spectrum, you are welcome in this conversation. We need you, as said by the People's Climate March and others, to change everything, we need everyone. And as we, are, we were reminded in our April summit, climate work must be racial justice work because it is people of the global majority who are on the front lines of the climate crisis. TCG's new strategic plan centers black indigenous people of color and theaters led by and for communities of color. So that commitment must show up in our work and our climate action work as well. Now, at our April summit, we spent a lot of time focused on case making. Why should theaters and theater makers take a leadership role in addressing the climate crisis? While case making continues to be important and we will continue to do that, this summit is moving away from the why to the how. We'll discuss uh, how we can support indigenous led climate resistance, how to connect the goals of the Paris Agreement to your own goal setting, and how to enact divestment and carbon budgeting strategies, as well as how to reimagine climate artistry. But before we move into the how, we want to go deeper into the why, because there's a difference between knowing climate action is, is knowing climate action is important and really commit into it. We wanted to create space for that deeper conversation about why. And just as we did in our last convening in November, emerging from the cave, we want to lead with the voice of the artists. To help us do just that, please join me in welcoming one of TCG's climate champions uh, to the screen, Devin Berkshire. Thank you, Adrian. Oh, I'm so grateful for the ways that you and Teresa have, have supported TCG moving toward really sustained climate action. So hello everyone, I am Devin Berkshire. I'm the Director of Conferences in Fieldwide Learning at TCG. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm on the land of the Muncie Lenape in Greenwood Lake, New York. And I've got short blonde hair, uh, a white sweater on, my grandmother's earrings, glasses on my head, and uh, a ceiling fan in my background. So before we get started with our opening conversation, which I am very excited about, I wanted to name and deeply thank my co-curators for this summit, Big Raksak Kongsang and Corinna Schulenberg. So you'll see more of them throughout the day. And the three of us are also responsible for co-hosting TCG's Climate Action Monthly Meetings, which I really hope you'll join. So we'll drop a link uh, to that community in the chat. If you have any issues joining the community, just email Corinna at the email address also in the chat. So I also uh, really wanna thank our partners in climate action, Groundwater Arts, Broadway Green Alliance, HowlRound, Superhero Clubhouse, and National Alliance for Musical Theater. It is so important for us to do this work in partnership and to name that in climate action in and beyond the theater field uh, that climate action has been happening for a long time. And TCG has an important role to play, but that role is not to colonize the leadership, climate leadership of people of the global majority, many of whom have been doing the work for generations. So as Adrian quoted earlier, to change everything, we need everyone. And in that spirit, we bring our resources, our relationships and our organizational strengths to this work. So one bit of housekeeping, those of you who've been coming to our monthly meetings or our virtual summits know how much we at TCG love our Padlets. Uh, and today is no exception. We will be continually referring to this Padlet we're dropping in the chat right now. Um, it's where we've already put quite a few resources and links that we'll be sharing and have shared. And uh, we'll continue to use it over the course of the day, but you can too. You can actually click on the plus sign in the lower right hand corner to add something of your own. So now on to our program. So in, in researching COP26, uh, which we'll talk more about later, uh, we came across a New York Times article that quoted uh, 
uh, collaborators of ours like Lanny Fu of Superhero Clubhouse, who has been making theater centered on climate action for over a decade. And she'll actually host a breakout later today on that topic. Um, and I think Big's dropping the link to the article in the chat. But the article also focused on the one piece of theater that was on the official schedule at COP26. Um, it was created and performed by Fainty Balligan. And uh, a theater, he is a theater and film artist who, who's really began to make a name for himself at the intersection of theater and climate justice, most visibly with his piece that was aired at COP26, Can I Live? Here's a quick trailer. So, let's start from the beginning. What is climate change? Why don't we talk about it? Why don't we talk about it live? Why don't we roll? Why don't we talk about it? Why don't we talk about it live? Why don't we roll? Why don't we talk about it? Why don't we talk about it live? Why don't we roll? Why don't we talk about it? Why don't we talk about it? I don't want to do the house down. <laughs> so we reached out to Fainty to speak with us today to help, um, really to help frame our time at this summit with his uh, personal story, which to me illustrates what's really possible when even a single artist puts their mind to making an impact with their art. So I'd love to welcome Fainty to the screen. Hello. Hi. Oh, Hi, we are so honored to have you with us. Um, uh, so I'm just going to get, <laughs> I'm just going to get into these questions um, for you. But it's, um, so I just going to start by asking. Uh, I I want everyone to know that I want to give Fainty's like whole bio. Um, and do that whole spiel, but we only have like 15 minutes to talk. So I just want to get to the heart of the matter and like Google's there for a reason. Uh, <laughs> you can find out all about you and anything that um, folks might want to know about you uh, is going to probably come up a little in the course of our conversation, but I just want to get to the heart of it. So um, first things first, how did it feel to have a piece of yours, Can I Live, shared at this big global climate summit, COP26, and and what role were you were you hoping it would play there? Um, uh, obviously, to change the world and end climate crisis. Um, obviously, um, <laughs> but that didn't happen. Um, how do I feel? It's quite a complicated question. The vindication of uh, of media outlet is um, quite a powerful elixir um, because you're told by uh, a, a, a respected quote unquote narrative that you matter. Um, but the whole point was to shout not about me mattering, but the fact that this whole structure doesn't work. So the two things working with each other is quite a, a a difficult thing but it definitely felt like a milestone um just because we wanted to we, we wanted to see what it's like to be in that building to talk to those people um to be face to face with <laughs> the people causing the problems quite frankly um and that's that's difficult that was a difficult thing because we then uncovered not so much uncovered, but saw, you know, the, the complicated corruption of it all. Um, uh, so, yeah, it, uh, yeah, ups and downs. <laughs> right? Yes, that, that, that makes absolute sense. But I do, I want to back up so everyone has, like, the context of how we even got to this point, right? How that was screened. Um, and, you know, I wish there was more theater screened there, but I'm glad it was your piece that was, um, if they were going to choose one. Uh, what, 
Would you like to let everyone know a little bit when we're in our um, our monthly meetings, we've started talking a little bit through like our climate stories, because ultimately this work is so, so deeply personal, right? Mm -hmm. We're doing it through so many different mediums and so many different spheres of, of influence, but what is, what is your climate story in terms of how, how you came to care about and then ultimately devote so much of your life to the climate crisis? Yeah. Uh, oh, that's a, that's, a, that's a long story. I'm going to make it as brief as I, as I possibly can. Um, I got into an argument with my mum uh, and she wanted to know why. In fact, now I'll, I'll go back a bit further. I did a play at the RSC in 2017, uh, all about climate change. And at that point, I didn't know anything about climate change. So I read up about it uh, for research, be became terrified, um, uh, then couldn't really leave my room without sort of scowling at people because I couldn't I couldn't work out why um, you were able, wh why everyone was just able to, to live life. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't, process it so uh, I made a decision in order to keep my sanity and to feel like I was doing something I was like I'm gonna be vegetarian and I'm gonna stop buying plastic and then I've done my bit like I did my bit I'll go on and I don't have to think about this anymore so um I didn't I didn't for for two years and then I started experiencing climate anxiety um because the fields in London were turning brown there were crops dying across the continent um, and I could feel it. I don't know, I, I'm quite an emotional person and I, I could just feel this something in me and I wanted to um, I wanted to be a part of something. So I tried to launch different initiatives, singularly, all failed. No one wanted to see me. Um, and then uh, I got this job. Oh, this is so brief. Got this job. I flew off to the desert. Um, but just before I did, um, I uh, got involved with XR, got massively into organising this, that, and the other, went away to do this job, um, came back, and the protest has happened. So I'd spent a lot of time organising, but I couldn't be there because I had to go to this job. And I got back. Um, I got into an argument with my mum because she couldn't work out why I was sacrificing my career to be an activist, uh, in a sense. Uh, and I couldn't either. And then so we we just we just argued and argued and argued and argued. And then our last argument, because this lasted about a month, I took my phone and I uh, recorded the conversation and I I put it under a pillow. Um, she, she didn't know until a year later. Uh, uh, so I recorded the entire conversation and I went home and I listened back to the conversation and I realised I was like, oh fuck, I'm gonna swear. It's fine. <laughs> I'm, I'm yes. very sweary. Real friends here. <laughs> I was like, oh, fuck. Like, she she has a point. Um, so then I, I took her voice recordings um, and I turned them into a climate lecture because I realised with the life that I have as an artist and the, you know, the, the place of being the people I meet, I sort of accidentally jumped social class, as you do as an actor. Like one month you, you're a... Uh, you're at the private members bar and the next month you're, you're working at the bar at the private members bar. Like it, it's a funny thing. Um, and so I met these people, I've been in this situation and thought, well, I can use my privilege to, um, to bridge the gap. I can talk to people that look like me, feel like me. Um, and I can also make a piece of work that is engaging and breaks all of this down to demystify um, climate change and remove it from its colonial perspective. Um, and that is a long story short. That is an amazing abridged <laughs> version of your story. And um, so I'm going to I'm going to pose a quote to you that we're using as a lot of inspiration for our, our um, because we're also somehow already running short on time. Um, we've been using this quote that uh, from Tony Cade Bambara, the role of the artist is to make the revolution irresistible. Um, does that resonate with what you're trying to do um, in a piece like, can I live? And another kind of version of that question is, who are you speaking to with that piece and what are you wanting them to come away with? Yeah, I'll answer that with a question, with a, with a story, a very brief one. When I was writing Can I Live, uh, I wrote the first speech. It was about a poem. It's about two pages long. And 
um, very excited. And so I read it to uh, Sam McBurney and Sam McBurney had a friend who was a scientist and got these scientists in, I think they're in, uh, where were those, Stockholm or something. And um, they were like, this is great because we can't do this. <laughs> we don't have the ability to say the things we need to say in the way that we need to in order for other people to understand. Um, and I really took that and resonated with that because I don't particularly, I, I, this is going to sound awful, I don't particularly think I'm a very clever person or, 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 or that I, I get very easily bored, very bored, very easy. And I love TikTok, which is a problem, sort of. Um, and I've, I've got a short attention span. So I know if it's not going to work for me, it probably won't work for my siblings or my friends or my cousins or my auntie. Um, because it, not only do we have to deliver a message, we have to deliver a right to that message and then empower and then give tools. There's a lot of work that has to be done that you can't expect a scientist to be able to do. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about anyone else on the call, anyone else listening ever, but I, I'm constantly trying to find my place in the world and where I'm useful. And I tend to think I'm really fucking good at this whole acting spiel. Um, and I quite like music and I quite like art and communicating and actually I can do that work the idea of making activism irresistible or revolution irresistible is how we place ourselves in society always historically we've always been part of that narrative whether we've been the jesters or we've been the storytellers to deliver a message we as artists shape society um, we have a responsibility in the sexiest fashion um, to make waves in that way. Um, so I, th I think I think it has to be part of every every decision we make going forward as, as to who who is this for, why, and how do we go forward? Otherwise, I'm, and I, and I don't mean what's the point. I just think we are more than what we allow ourselves to be because of the parameters that we're given. I, this is coming off topic, but I promise I'm coming back. The, the sort of like, the climate change is a symptom of capitalism, right? It's not the deal. Capitalism is the deal. And that's where we get colonialism, racism. Da, da, da. Um, and it's within that narrative of capitalism that we limit what we are. Because in order to survive, we have to make a certain amount of money, be sellable, do this, that, and become this, that, and the other. And, you know, I'm not saying I'm apart from that. I'm part of that structure. Um that limits our ideas of what we can do. So for instance, like theatre buildings becoming uh, community centres, housing kids when they're in storms, um, becoming centres to learn from, theatre shows being more than just a show about um, entertaining someone or catharsis, like being a place of discussion and growth, going outside of the structure. And that's why I really like working with complicity because they're not worried about structure. And surely if you do all of these things and you're working for the community as opposed to the individual, individual, they are inherently anti-capitalist goals. Um, so these are all, and everything I say sounds complicated in a sense, but it's just not. And that's what art does. It just makes it very, very simple, very easy. This is bullshit. Let's do something about it. And here's how we do it. And like, boom, do you know what I mean? And I thought that was really important. And I felt for me, I think in the West especially, um, people need to see versions of themselves. And I thought, I don't see many people who look like me, talk like me, come from where I come from, talking about this or delivering these messages. So that's what I can do. And that's what I will do. Um, and so that that's what I thought the, the, was important in my work in this. Um, uh, yeah, time. That, that you just you actually magically answered like two more of my questions so that was a that was a very efficient use of our remaining time and I, I have like one more minute so I just wanted to um, make sure everyone knows if they are going to be able to find can I live somewhere online anytime soon or experience that work post cop 26 is that going to come is it available now or is it going to come back around? 
So it finished last weekend, unfortunately. <laughs> but, um, uh, w- w- we're working out a plan. We're working out next steps of, of what to do. We really want uh, this piece to not just be a piece that is perfunctory. Uh, we ran workshops along with it. We've been trying to do it at community centres with different grassroots movements, um, trying to bring those to the forefront into, into mass media. Um, so hopefully next year we'll be part of that journey. Um, yeah, so just keep keep looking out um, because there'll be news. Just <laughs> keep looking out. I think, I think you might have just gotten around 80 more uh Instagram followers or whatever. <laughs> so, uh, everyone, do check out Fainty's work more online. It has really been a truly an honor having you with us. Thank you for indulging us in even a brief conversation. And thank you for all the work that you do. And please keep doing it. Thank you. Thank you for having yeah. me. Thanks, of everyone. <laughs> so, uh, it is now um, my pleasure um, to. Uh, welcome one of my co-curators, Corinna Schulenberg, to the screen. Thank you so much, Devin. That conversation was amazing. Um, it's been so much fun working with you and Big on this summit. Uh, it's a reminder that although the stakes are really, really high, theater people love stakes. Uh, and this work can be joyful. And it's a real joy and an honor for me to introduce this next session, the culture of indigenous led climate resistance. First, I'm Corinna. I use she, her pronouns. I'm joining you from the lands of the Muncie Lenape and Canarsie. And my visual description is, I am a middle-aged white woman with long reddish brown hair, wearing a cute blue floral shirt. Now, why is this summit beginning with honoring indigenous-led climate resistance? Well, in the words of Anishinaabe writer, Riley Yeno, there is no climate action without indigenous people. In so many ways, the climate crisis began with colonization. Ecocide has always been a strategy of genocide. You see it when Washington ordered the destruction of Senecan and Cayugan fields and orchards to extirpate their peoples. You see it when US generals monetize the slaughter of nearly 30 million buffalo until only a few hundred were left. These acts of genocide were also acts of ecocide. And really only the scale has changed over the past hundred years. Now it's not just a single ecosystem, but the whole planet. So if we don't prioritize indigenous-led climate resistance, we will not only be ineffective, but it's likely will actually reinforce the colonialism that brought us to this edge. And indigenous-led climate resistance is effective. According to the Indigenous Resistance Against Carbon Report, indigenous resistance has stopped or delayed greenhouse gas pollution equivalent to at least one quarter of annual US and Canadian emissions. We'll put that report in the chat for you. One quarter of emissions is huge, but their leadership goes beyond direct action to stop fuels. Indigenous peoples steward about 22% of the world's surface, yet that holds 80% of the earth's biodiversity. And you know, so often when I hear my fellow settlers say, or when I say it myself, I don't know what to do. The climate crisis is so overwhelming. The good news is the knowledge already exists. It has existed on these lands for thousands of years. We just need to show up and try to be in right relationship. And it's my belief that being in right relationship with indigenous led climate resistance is above all a conversation about culture. And aren't we theater people, culture makers and culture bearers? Because I've noticed in my own efforts to show up for indigenous led movements, how important cultural practice is to those movements. So if it's true that indigenous leadership is where we must begin our climate action, and if it's true that culture is at the heart of that leadership, 
And if it's true that we ourselves are culture makers, what then becomes possible? What then becomes necessary? We're only gonna to begin to ask these questions today, but I hope we will carry them forward into the rest of the convening and all the way to COP27 and beyond. To help us do that, it is my deep honor to welcome our speakers to the screen. Help me welcome Reverend Houston Cypress, Sherry Foytlin, Sachem Hawkstorm, Nawashahu Yawanawa Bergen. We're so grateful to have you with us today. Thank you. To begin, I'm hoping that each of you can introduce yourselves and talk about the work you're doing and how we can support it. One of the goals of this session is to direct tangible resources to your work and to the work of indigenous climate leadership in all of our communities. So please tell us what you're doing and how we can support. Um, and we will start with you, Houston. All right. Um, good afternoon, friends and family. I was experiencing some tech problems. Can you hear me okay? Just let me know. All right, thank you. So my name is um, Houston Cypress, and I'm from the Otter Clan, which is one of the families that make up the Miccosukee tribe of Indians of Florida. And I consider myself an artist and environmentalist, and I work with the nonprofit that I started, Love the Everglades Movement. My pronouns are he and they, and I'm also a two-spirit person. And I'm here in my homelands, which is what we refer to as Kahayatli. These are lands that are cared for by my people, the Miccosukee, as well as our friends from the Seminole tribe of Florida and the independent Miccosukee Seminole people of the land. This place is also known as the Greater Everglades, which is west of Miami, Florida. And I am an indigenous person with a light brown complexion. I'm wearing glasses, my hair, my long, beautiful hair is pulled back in a ponytail. And I'm wearing a light blue turquoise jacket, which is decorated with the patchwork textile art of my community, the Miccosukee and Seminole people. So just to tell you a little bit about how I do my work, why it's important to me, who I serve. Um, I wanted to start out with this quote um, by Angela Davis. And the quote is that walls turned sideways are bridges. So how I do this work is that I uphold the traditional spiritual practices of my people. And that includes holding up a wall to that sometimes because these are sacred practices. And some things we can share, but a lot of things we cannot share with you. But in terms of turning these walls sideways into a bridge, like there's other spiritual practices that I embrace, and this is a universalist spiritual practice. And that just means finding the commonalities that we all share, and also finding ways to respect all the different spiritual traditions and faith practices that are out there. Uh, in a very practical sense, um, I also honor and uphold gender diversity from multiple perspectives, indigenous perspectives and other perspectives. Um, here in my home community, the Miccosukee Tribe, I like to serve on this environmental advisory committee that we have, and it's made up of different community members because we want to make sure that different perspectives, even from our own tribe, are honored whenever we talk about the Everglades or environmental concerns. Um, a couple years ago, me and my buddies started a nonprofit that we call the Love the Everglades Movement. And basically that means using all the tools and all the tactics that's available to us. So we started this nonprofit a couple of years ago because we wanted to be a model for indigenous solidarity for this region. And um, what we do is we integrate the indigenous priorities as our own nonprofit priorities. Like other people can do that. What are local indigenous communities asking for? Integrate that into your policies whether that's your organizational policies or the environmental policies of your municipality, your state or uh, federal laws, like integrate that and put it on the books. Um, we got to show up for nature. So that's creative solidarity with the natural world too. 
And what that means in practice is listen very deeply to what nature is saying. Practice, you'll get better at it. And you'll be able to intuit and maybe um, listen directly to what nature is saying to you. So listening deeply is a good part of this practice. Um, and we, when, we, when we talk about all the tools and tactics that's available, art is especially important to me and my colleagues, art and culture, because for me, I find that the convening aspect of art, bringing people together, especially through the social practice is vital. Um, we're definitely about inspiring action, direct actions, especially the ones that are uh, organized and led by indigenous people is here in my region. Um, we work through policy and politics. We got to change the laws that are problematic. We work through science, education, and research, especially the indigenous-led sciences of the Miccosukee and Seminole people. And um, yeah, we got to get the word out too. So get the word out through the press, get the word out through the media. And we consider that like public storytelling because that's how I grew up here in my home, listening to the stories of my elders and my family. Uh, we don't have to share those stories directly, but we can do that tradition of storytelling publicly. So like overall, like in a spiritual sense, um, where like Bob Marley said, we chant down Babylon. And so our organization, the Love the Everglades movement, what we want to be is a, um, I guess you could call it something like a concierge for direct action for the Everglades. So if you want to know what you can do, call us up and we'll offer advice and suggestions for you. But the reason I do this work is because I want the future generations to benefit from the medicine that sustained me and my community when I was growing up. Um, I want the songs and the dances to continue to resonate throughout space and time in perpetuity. Um, this phrase, sharing the joys of our garden with one another is poetic, but it's also literal. Like we have our fruits and veggies and we can share and that brings people together and that puts a smile on our faces. Um, what are the values, the communities, the projects and the practices that we're cultivating? And um, like thinking about garden work um, as we spread it across the landscape, we're caring for the landscape. We're tending to what's there and we're tending to what should be there. So like as an environmentalist, the water quality is very foundational um, to support multiple species out here. When you get the water right, the animals thrive, the people thrive, um, the plants thrive and the practices thrive. So water quality is always a good place to start, especially from um, the Miccosukee environmental priorities that we are articulating. Uh, when we talk about restoration, preservation and conservation, these can sound like big words, but like a simple way to understand them is put it back, restore, don't use it, preserve, and use it wisely, conserve. But overall, like the things that we're always talking about out here is let nature heal. And that means leave it alone and let nature have its rhythms and support nature's rhythms. Like who do I work for? Like when I do this kind of work, I'm always keeping in mind the idea of the circle of life. And what that means is that we got to prioritize all the other species. And we as people have these uh, skills and talents that we can do that. So it's not about uh, supporting people in their priorities, but what can we do to support the overall circle? Um, in general, I, I look to the indigenous communities for inspiration and leadership. And so like here locally, we have the Miccosukee tribe of Indians of Florida. We have the Seminole tribe of Florida. And then we have the independent communities which are not federally recognized. We gotta listen to them. Um, I also wanna do this work because I want Florida citizens to enjoy what's out here because those are voters. Those, are gonna, those people are gonna change the laws. And be, basically like anybody around the world like who wants to come out here and connect with the greater Everglades. There's a lot to enjoy. There's a lot to be inspired by. So come on out and check it out. But in a very practical sense, like how can you support our work here through Love the Everglades movement? How can you support the priorities of the indigenous communities out here? Well, like I said, let's use all the tools and tactics that's available to us. In fact, let's bend these tools that are available to us. And in that way, we decolonize these tools. Um, when it comes to the scientific tools, um, the Miccosukee people are relying on the circle of life philosophy 
when we have important decision-making points when we're using these scientific tools. That's how we bend the tools of science. We don't necessarily think of it objectively. We think of it as how can we support the circle of life? So um, political sovereignty for the indigenous people is very important because we always have issues with the consultation process. Um, here in Florida, the EPA gave certain permitting authority over to the state and that diminishes our exercise of sovereignty. So I would ask for your support in rescinding the 404 permitting that, that is authorized by the Clean Water Act. Like that's a big problem for us. Uh, again, support our sciences, support our educational fund, like support the next generation of Miccosukee and Seminole people. Uh, you can support the nonprofit, that's cool, but really I think that some of the best ways that you can support what we're doing out here is just come and visit, get to know the land, connect, but at certain times you do have to stay away, like when we're doing ceremonies and things like that, like there's always a line. Um, collaborate, invitations, all that sort of stuff is great, um, but there's definitely real things that we need help with, like um, rescinding a biological opinion that protects one species of bird, the Cape Sable Seaside Sparrow, but that is a detriment to all the other species that need protection. So it's not like we have um, something against this one bird species, it's rather that we love all of the species out here. So let's increase funding for Everglades restoration at the state and federal level. Um, again, let's support nature's rhythms and that means opening up the gates that prevent the water flow. Um, there's a big, beautiful lake here in the middle of the state of Florida. It's called Lake Okeechobee. And unfortunately, like there is a legacy of nutrients that have um, built up in the mud at the bottom of the lake. Help us to get that out. That's a big Herculean effort, but it can be done. People put that um, pollution in there. People are going to take it out. So let's work together to do that. And um, overall, like, let's, let's get these unnecessary nutrients out of the watershed in general. Um, because as we do this restoration work, things bounce back. The birds come back, the plants come back, the water gets cleaner, it's doable. We've seen the success of restoration projects in places like the Kissimmee River. So those are some things that I would uh, offer to invite you to support us, why and how I do it. Um, there's a bunch of resources and links that I'm going to share with you after the event. I've already um, put some links in the Padlet. And one of the most important things I want to bring your attention to is the accountability framework. Cities can use that to transition to clean energy. And there's a guide for that. Check out the Padlet. Um, check out the film that I shared on the Padlet. And check out the talk on Indigenous contemporary art as well. But thanks for your time. I want to hear what other people have to say. I hope I didn't go over too long, but I appreciate y'all very much. And I want to see you soon somewhere deep in the greater Everglades. Thanks, friends. Thank you so much, Houston, for everything that you shared. Um, I particularly heard that theaters and theater people could be aware of the indigenous priorities in their community and integrate them into their organization. So let's all do that. We're going to be making some commitments at the end of the session, and that's one big thing we can do. Um, I want to turn it over now to hear from Sherry Foytman. Hi, uh, my name is Cherie Foytlin. I'm a, a Afro-Indigenous woman. I have six beautiful kids. I'm living in Northern New Mexico now, but prior to this, I lived in uh, South Louisiana for a good number of years. And we fought a little project down there called the Bayou Bridge Pipeline, which was the tail end of the Dakota Access Pipeline. But I really started um, way before that <laughs> in uh, right around the time of the BP oil spill. Now, look, I grew up in Oklahoma, running the field, running in the woods. You know, that was our that was our play place. And I always loved the environment. And so I would give to, you know, nonprofit, big nonprofits every year and think I was really doing something. But when the BP oil spill happened, I had an I was working at, for a paper I was a reporter. And I had an opportunity to go jump on a boat with a fisherman and his little boy, who was about five. And um, yeah, we went out on the boat and it wasn't very long that we came across just like this huge slick that basically surrounded the boat. And uh, inside the, the water was a pelican. And we thought at first that we could take this pelican and get back to Fort Jackson, where they were cleaning the pelicans at the time. But we didn't make it. And so we ended up just idling down the boat and just like, sitting with this pelican as it passed away and I remember that this big like Cajun man like huge man 
felt too easy because he didn't know what he was going to get back. You know, it's true. Like things do come back from oil spills, but some things just don't. And at the end, his little boy ended up getting sick. But at that time, it was just the three of us. And we were just like, everyone was just very moved. We were just all together. And I came home and I looked were asleep. My ex now was my husband then. He's asleep. And I looked in the mirror and I thought to myself, what am I doing? I look at this bad, like, first of all. And then what what's going on? What have I done to contribute to that? What have I done to not contribute to that or to teach my children different? And so, yeah, I mean... Uh, from the beginning, like, you know, we have this like insensitive culture in society here on Turtle Island where we do feel like, you know, we're the, um, the keepers of this land. I, my blood has been on this, in this land since time immemorial from all the way down to the Mayans, uh, the, uh, in the Yucatan to the Dene Navajo people. Um, and that always like is, a, is, has been in my spirit, but something awoke that day that reminded me that not only do I get to take the privilege of being who I am, serving my identity and raising my children, but I have the responsibility to stand up and to take action in the opposite direction, to, to, um, to, to fix the wrongs, basically. Right. So, um, yeah, we, we did this campaign down there. I also like worked on the Bayou Bridge, uh, the Bayou Bridge Pipeline. We had bought 11 acres and we turned that into a camp that was right in line with the with the pipeline was going to go through it. And uh, we ended up saving that land. They ended up having to go around us. So even though the pipeline did eventually go through, we delayed it by three years, which is part of what the the um, that report was about. Actually, we were included in that report. So yeah, I mean, we just been rolling along and 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 doing good stuff. We have now that piece of property is called the Indian uh, Bayou Food Forest, and the um, the idea around that is that you know we're in a very scary situation right now with the where with where the earth is right, and we feel like through cl around climate change in particular we have basically two paths right. I mean, there is going to have to be at some point, like a major like change and shift in the way we think about things. But in the meantime, capitalism is gonna come in and it's gonna take advantage. So now we're gonna see BP end up with all these solar panels and they're still gonna be raping the land somewhere else and things like that. But we wanna take that away from them. They've had it for a long time. We wanna give it back to the people on the ground who are being most affected by climate change because we know that the richest countries in the world are creating the, the most emissions, are creating the most problems. And the people that get left out are the people who have to suffer the most from those effects. Well, there's the people in Africa and St. James, Louisiana, where it's the people, and it's always, almost always native and black folks. And so we're talking when, when a lot of times well, I'll hear other people like, you know, nonprofit people or whatever, talk about, you know, their job or their role at, of like helping. And that's great. That's all great. But listen, we're trying to survive. And we've been trying to survive for like 500 years of this stuff. And don't get me wrong. We ain't the first generation and we ain't going to be the last. Like my kids are coming up strong. You know, my little girl is suing the government. She's part of our children's trust. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, I just want to make sure that everyone understands that um, we can do this. And along those two roads, we have to figure out how to protect our communities. And on the other side of the road, we have to figure out how to build our communities. And so Indian Body Food Forest is about building. And in the meantime, I go out and I fight like hell. I fight. And anytime I can't. And I use theater and I use like bring, organizing and bringing people together. And I use actions where I get on top of cr trains, uh, cranes. And I, I've been arrested 18 times, never really wanted to, but that's how it turned out. Um, and I'm, what I'm trying to say is like, the feeling of love that we have for this earth means nothing. If we refuse to take that same amount of courage and eat it and bring it back up and fight with every fight that we have. And you've got to follow Native people because this is our land and no one knows how to build it back up more than we do. So I guess I'll stop there. Sorry if I went over, but uh, we'll talk more later. Thanks. Sherry, I'm so grateful for everything you shared. And I really just want to boost the, the way that you talked about the risks that you've taken, which I know from reading and listening to some of the other things you've shared are a lot more than what you've shared now. And y'all, we've got to, we've got to put ourselves there. 
uh, you know, right now the burden of risk is falling on Native peoples, is falling on Black peoples, Black people, and that's that's not okay. <laughs> you know, um, so I just want to like really name like how honored I am to have you here, Sherry, and how I really hope that we're not only gonna shift resources toward, toward you and your work, but we're gonna be willing to put our bodies in those places, right? And take on some of that risk. Um, and I also can't wait to talk to you about the musical that you put on, but, but we'll save that for later. <laughs> Cause that was amazing. Cause I wanna make sure that we do, um, we do get to hear from everybody before we move into the conversation. So now it is my great honor to welcome uh, Seachem Hawkstorm and Nawa Shahu Yawanawa to and Bergen to uh, speak to us. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, first, I, I would like to say that uh, we're very honored to be here, and um, you know, it's always good when people come together to to make a change and to be a part of what what we do. Um, to introduce myself. Um, Wigawawa Shawanan Kasik Pasek of the Scattercook First Nations peoples. Um, I am also by the name of Yawawa Masharawa uh, through the Yawanawa peoples, Brazil. Um, and I, I want to say, Kayanan Manimek Anishik Aninik, Wantut Manitu, Kayanan Manimek Anishik Aninik, Akinaguk. And uh, to always be mindful to thank the creator and thank the earth mother for bringing us together uh, in this way today. Uh, and I'll, I'll let the uh, Washaho introduce herself and then we can talk a little bit about what we're doing. Masharai everyone. Uh, uh, I'm Nawashaho Yawanawa Bergen. I'm from Yawanawa peoples in Brazil. Um, so great and honored to be here today. Uh, thank you so much for this, for this great opportunity to share more with our relatives. Um, yeah, very excited to, to talk more and share more about our communities and how we work, what we are doing here in Nova York. Thank you. So um, I guess I'll start with uh, some of the work that we do. Um, I, we are indigenous delegates to the uh, United Nations at the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. Um, and we uh, are very strong activists um, for the global climate movement. Um, we, I have led the, uh, both climate marches, the uh, climate strike in, in New York, um, as well as uh, work with Drawdown for a number of years and spoke with a bunch of scientists to try to uh, shift the way that they think with a more indigenous perspective. Uh, one of the main things that I, I, I know is that language is a major cause of, of the problems that we're having. You know, one of a major part of, of colonization was to remove our language and our understanding of who we are on the planet. And this didn't just happen to us here uh, in Brazil or in, in New York. Uh, this happened around the world uh, to indigenous peoples. Um, there was indigenous peoples on every continent. Uh, there's a, a, a great forgetness of this, this history is uh, forgotten and the stories are lost. The, the way that we talk about things now from a colonial lens using English or, or Portuguese or these, these uh, colonial languages, um, they take away the meaning and the story in everything that, that we are and everything that is here. Um, just for a quick example, uh, in our language, we say, Nibi, which would mean the living water. It doesn't mean water. If you, if you say water, you're really not saying, you don't know what that is. What is water, right? H2O, well, uh, water is the combination of all of its parts. 
And in order to survive in any environment that you are in, you need to drink the water from that environment so that your body can adapt to that environment. Um, and this is part of the work that we do is reteaching how to uh, think about language and how, how we are um, uh, in right relationship with, with the land, the water, the trees, the, the medicines, uh, the foods. And, and learning the stories behind each one. And so we use our indigenous traditional knowledge in that way. Um, you know, just something as simple as maple syrup. Uh, now it's uh, mass produced using hoses from tree to tree. Uh, but when we go back to our original teachings and we listen to the stories of how and why we get the maple syrup, when we, when we think about uh, Gluskip and how he came to the village and, and the village was destroyed. Nobody was taking care of anything. The crops were not growing. The houses were disarray. And he went to find his people and he goes into the woods and, and there they are laying under these broken branches from the maples and they're just drinking maple syrup directly from the branches and fat and lazy. And he says, go back to work, go back to taking care of your families and they don't, they don't want to move. So Gluskov goes to the river and he takes this giant basket and he pours water into the maple trees and so much water that when they, that they're laying under it, they're, now they're just starting to drink water and they started getting back up and going back into their, their, uh, their daily lives and, and, you know, got away from that. And so Gluskov left and when he came back a year later, People are asking him, why, why did you take away our maple? Why can't, can we have it back? And, and Gluskip says, well, look at your fields attended, your families are taken care of, and you're no longer lazy. I'll give it back to you, but I'll give it back to you in a different way. Now you can only have maple syrup one time a year, and you have to collect it from each tree and with this basket. And then you have to boil it. And it takes this much water to make this much syrup. And so it, it was that lesson that we got from the maple syrup and that, that we have to bring back. Uh, so we're teaching this to our children and we're planting food forests. I was so glad to hear Sherry talk about the food forest. Um, at Kaskawak in New York, uh, we've planted, we, we, we were able to get 73 acres back and we are using it as a teaching tool to, to plant a food forest in the forest. And, um, and it kind of changes what we're talking about with farming and food, right? But we're also, uh, all the forests have been just so destroyed and we're looking at the resilience of, of our earth mother coming back. But if she doesn't have all the seeds that she used to have, how can she bring back all the foods? So we're assisting her by bringing back all of these, these seeds and these foods that are meant to be there. And so uh, over the last two years, we planted over 2000 trees and, and a thousand ramps and six pounds of ginseng seed and, and a bunch of things and, and bringing back those natural foods and medicines and plants that need to be there in our environment. And then teaching the, the, the children as to why and the adults uh, relearning uh, who we are on this planet. And now um, we're also doing this in, in Brazil. So uh, I'll let yes. Masha take over. Yes, it's so important for us to, to tell our history, to, to talk in our language, to live it, how, to remember who we, we are in this planet, to feel connect, connected with the nature, to protect and to share the knowledge with people. And, for us here, we understand how important is all the all medicines and how we don't need to go in our village, like we don't need to go to the hospital when, when the snake bites us because we have a whole medicine in the, in the jungle. And we need to understand how it's important to, to protect this knowledge to pass for the future generation. I see this in my community here in Brazil, and we try to to remember and to to explain for people how we need to feel strong and we need to remember our history and our language. We need to talk in our language in the community. We can't talk in Portuguese. We need to remember we have our own language. So uh, I completely 
uh, in my own community at Shukubu na village. We're trying to, we have plenty to there. We want to, to share a whole uh, knowledge with our community because some people, they all so disconnected and we need to remember who we are. And I feel so, so proud to this, this whole history. And because I feel dizzy, I feel, I feel we all connected. We all belong in this net. So we need to understand how important it is to tell our history and be living in reciprocity with the nature. We need to, we need to, to, to protect because we need to do this for kids, for the future generation. It's so important for us, it's so important for them. So uh, I totally uh, feel so, so proud and so honored to, to listen or like, or share what I should say about food forests, about how it's important to have our medicines, our ceremony and our language, our music. And it's a whole, it's amazing how we can, we can remember and live in, in diversity with the nature. So uh, yes, I, I just want you to, I feel very honored, very, very happy to, to I'm mean, listening here, I'm mean, learning so much and I want to share with my community. I want to say, listen, we, we need to be strong. We need to, to feel so strong because we are champions. We are champions of this world and we need to feel empowered. Thank you. Thank you both so much. I, I wonder if before we move into the main conversation, if the two of you could just talk about, uh, because I was so moved to learn about it, about the ways in which the villages have grown for the Yawanawa people, the language is growing. It, it's amazing what you've both been able to do and you know others as well. Could you just talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, over the last uh, 12, 12 years now, mm -hmm. um, the Yana peoples under uh, started with uh, Nawashaw's great grandfather, yeah. uh, who uh, actually decided that it was time to, to remove the missionaries out of their territory. And they uh, fought to get their land back. My father was the one to to fight so hard and I feel so proud because when he tells this history for us and I feel he, he's so strong, he's, so, he's champions because we was totally slave and today you have the freedom to dream and to decide how we want to live it and it's so amazing. Yeah. Right now um, we have uh, 10, 10 now now villages and Shukovina village is the newest village that we established two years ago. Um, it was a dream uh, for quite a few years, uh, your father and, and you. And, um, and so two years ago, we partnered up together uh, with our people in New York, and with uh, her family. And, and now we have, we have a village that we're working towards sustainability and language and teaching medicines. And, and uh, we have, how many families are there now? Like 10, 10 or 15 yeah. families there um, now. And, and uh, it's actually a living, breathing uh, village. And um, we're working towards being as sustainable as possible uh, to keep our people in the forest where we belong. And, um, you know, we're trying to teach that also in New York, uh, which, as you know, is very difficult. But we do have um, the problem now with Bolsonaro, where he's trying to demarcate uh, the indigenous territories so that the farmers and the miners can come in and destroy the rainforest. And we're seeing giant tandem trucks coming out every day, uh, 10 to 20 giant trucks taking trees out of the Amazon uh, rainforest in Acre, and uh, everybody thinks the rainforest is so big, but it becomes very small, very fast. Um, we're on the front lines and literally the only barrier between the un uncontacted tribes that are still here. Uh, and uh, with COVID, we even saw 
uh, uncontacted tribe have to come out into Turvaka and uh, and get support because they were dying from from the farmers and the miners coming into the forests and giving them COVID. So it's a very real uh, situation, but we feel if we lead by example and and show people that 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 this is possible. Uh, that people will wake up and, and remember who they are and, and their place in nature. And we are the most affected, like the very affected from this climate. Like, oh uh, my God, the flooding? The flooding, and, and we can't drink our water anymore because we could, we could sick. We have diarrhea, the whole community could sick because uh, we, we probably don't have clean water in our village. And I remember in COVID time, we don't have any more and the river was so big and the, all the tributaries were so big and it was impossible for us. And I was, oh my God, like, what I can do? Like my own family don't have clean water. They, I see a whole kid sick and- Kids dying. Kids dying and it's it's very sad because we are very affected for this, this climate change and we need to we need to understand. And it's, it's how important it is to protect because it's, really hard and sad or oh, we see we all land is we share with Katkinas people and they are most affected too and I see I see the community so affected like so poor, so poor and no yeah, support. it's hard to get support and people need to understand need to see need to to know this and to feel I think one of the biggest problems that we have is that the people with the most money don't live in the most affected areas and they're not attached to it, but they're the ones driving it. Like their consumerism and their capitalism is driving what's happening in, in all of the poorest communities and countries. Um, you know, America thinks it's so great, but really it's the biggest ter terrorist organization on the planet when it comes to, to, indigenous peoples and when it comes to to peoples of color you know they're the ones that are driving this and so uh, we get to see it firsthand and it's and it's hard <clears throat> thank you for you know uh speaking honestly about that reality you know we as witnesses to it now we can't say we don't know <laughs> if any of us didn't know now we know um and I'm hopeful that one of my colleagues, if they haven't already, will put in the information on how to um, send you both money <laughs> to continue the frontline work that you're doing is like one small way that we can show our support. Um, so I'm hoping that folks will do that. Um, thank you. Um, uh, and I really do think, you know, there's there's uh, some of the larger not for profits, of course, are doing good work. But when you can really be supporting folks who are on the front lines, indigenous folks who are on the front lines, that's where you make the real difference. And I hope you can hear about the difference that is being made. Um, and we can't waste time in supporting these folks. Uh, it's so urgent. Um, so now we move into our conversation, uh, which I'm so excited about. And really, you know, the 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 prompt is very open. However you all want to reply to it is how we can reply to it. But it, it's about uh, culture. You know, theater people are culture makers. Um, for, for many theaters and theater people who are operating within a white settler context, our culture of making theater is colonial. Um, and many of us are trying to move away from that. <laughs> um, but I'm curious about how you conceive culture and its role in your work. Um, and so whoever wants to like, you know, speak first to that. Um, honoring what Houston said about some of it is a wall and some of it is a bridge. So please only share the bridge, um, but whatever you can share about the role culture plays. Well, I can start asking you a question. Oh, oh yeah, Houston, go ahead. I would, I would like to, um, culture is a bridge. Again, it comes back to like inspiring action, um, being able to see ourselves in that position. And so I think representing the beauty of the varieties of people that are out there is vital to um, 
to inspiring the action. Whether like I, I remember growing up out here in Mikasuki, like I didn't really get to see um, Two Spirit or LGBTQ Indigenous people on the screen, so I kind of felt very lonely. So when we have the diversity of people on the stage or on screen, I think that that inspires us to stand up because when we can imagine the possibilities, I think that that's again an invitation to do things to 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 celebrate joy, to stand up and fight, uh, to continue to sing and dance and celebrate. So I think um, I think that the representation is vital, whether it, any kind of art form, um, inspiring action. I think that's one of the great things that uh, that culture and and how I use that in my work too. And again, um, it brings people together. Like it takes a community to put on a theatrical work. And um, and I also like was really inspired by. Um, if, forgive me if I say their name wrong, but Lansing Fu um, and the Superhero Clubhouse how they were able to create like theater works and plays like on the land, like get it out of the theater, get it out of that building and do these works on the land. And maybe that these works are not just um, um, reenactment of stories, but maybe this work can actually put plants on the ground. Uh, maybe we can create theatrical gardening pieces, like put it in the ground. So these are some things that that, that question brings up to mind. And thank you, Houston. Does anybody wanna jump in? Hi. Yeah, well, for us from the beginning, like the very first thing that we did was talk to the people who's laying. This was in South Louisiana. So this is um, the Taka by Ishtak people, United Home Nation, uh, the Choctaw, um, no, and there's other groups. But um, I, the very first thing we did was figure out where we were at. And it was a talk about Ishak land and we had ceremony out there the very first day. Uh, and uh, we asked permission. And if they just said no, then we would have had to have gone a different way. But they said, yeah, we asked them, can we fight from this property right here on your land? And can we grow um, things for the future? And, and uh, they said yes. And they've been back several times. They, they come and hang out and check it out and, uh, you know, see what's going on. Um, so, yeah. And then in our actions and what we did, we incorporated ceremony, especially in the beginning, um, but around this direct action campaign, which we didn't even do until they actually start, you know, doing the labor. And uh, one of the things like from the beginning, we had decided like we were in South Louisiana and in South Louisiana, it's a really oil soaked place. Like a lot of people work for the industry or their family works for the industry. And even though it's killing them, uh, they're bought into this idea that they that they have to support it. And so we knew from the top that this was going to be like an uphill climb. And so we, we needed everybody on our, on our side. And so by, by saying that, when we had ceremony, I, one of the things I thought was so important was we just didn't have ceremony for um, humans. I mean, we definitely asked for permission, but we asked all the things around us to help support us and to protect us and to, and to like guide us. And I can tell you from experience, I can tell you, that when we were out in the middle of that swamp doing the direct action and it was hot and the only way to get there was by boat and those cops showed up, the swamp had beat the hell out of them. They came with no shoes on because they had lost their boots. They were, they were hot. They were sticky. We gave them water because I was afraid one of them was going to die. I mean, I, I seriously was worried about them. We helped guide them out a couple of times out of the swamp so they wouldn't get lost and get injured. And, um, and so, yeah, I, I'm just trying to make the point that I think that, that it has to start in a, in, a, in a very clear place where you are just um, giving yourself to um, this struggle in, in all ways. And that you are asking and being so, we were so full of gratitude that we had these opportunities to fight this fight. Because if you can't find joy in the struggle, if you can't find like fulfillment, uh, you know, it's what is, what's the use? What are we fighting for, right? So as we instill like this, this resistance into our kids, we also have to like instill within, the, within this, this idea of, of joy around the movement and, and finding, connecting and networking and, 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 and also like just being so humble in the way that you ask for your, for space to do the work that you need to do, if that makes sense. We uh, we had ball games out there on the on the easement, and there was one time we had something called Crawfish the Musical, 
And uh, we were in South Louisiana, of course. Yeah, I got to get that Cajun flair out there. And uh, we, someone dressed like a crawfish. We had a whole play that we put on on the easement. And the workers had to stop because we were right there all over the place. We ran it two times. We did an encore. And um, at the end of both <laughs> times, the workers clapped. They clapped. And we always thought that's so funny. But do you know that like two years later, I was reading an article and in the article, it was about a man in South Louisiana who was starting a solar company. And in the article, he said that he had been an oil uh, drill. He was a pipeline worker and that he had gone to a, a, a job one day and that there were people out there dressed like crawfish, did this whole entire musical. And he thought to himself, and I know it was that day, he thought to himself, you know, uh, well, maybe we could do something different. You know, and it just made him think like, you know, and so the next thing, you know, like he took that action. We didn't do that. And that's my biggest thing to tell everybody. That's the secret right there. You are never going to know what your legacy is or how you touch people or how you change this world. Don't expect to. It's not going to happen. And sometimes it's going to feel like you lost, like you, like you, you, like you gave your all in and you did get it. But let me tell you something. There is no way to lose because what you're doing is you're inspiring other people to take action on their own behalf, right? I always say courage breeds courage, right? Don't expect anything back. Right. And you will be blessed in so many ways. That's just the way it is. That's just the law of her. Oh. <laughs> oh my goodness, Sherry. Um feeling some things. Uh thank you for sharing that story. Thank you for reminding us of the power of story. Theater people, we gotta know our power. We gotta know the power that we have and that we could have in showing up for these indigenous-led movements. Um we are running short on the, the colonial entity known as time. Um, but I want to make sure that we at least get a chance to hear um, from everybody on this question on culture. So I'm going to make space for Seachem and Nawashahu to speak if they want to, to this question of culture. Yeah, um, for us, culture drives everything. Um, and uh, we start with we start our day by calling each other. Um, it's not by name, you know, we'll call each other across the villages just by making sounds. And, uh, you know, when we're hiking through the woods, we're calling each other, we, each call means something different. Um, and there's different inflections in your call. There's, everybody has their own call. Um, you know, when we started this process of working together, we did it through a pipe ceremony and we did it with our songs and we and we sat down with our traditional songs from the north and the Yawanawa songs from the south and and bringing these this agreement together uh, in this way. Um, it's it's everything for us. It's like our understanding of who we are on this planet comes from our culture and and how we're teaching our children what we want uh, to see for them and what they want to see for us. You know, we learn from the kids all the time. Do we want to colonize our children? No, they 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 are already um, so much more connected than we are. Uh, we call them jungle. <laughs> They're more jungle than we are, right? Because we have to live in both worlds and they don't have to listen to that. Um, and so uh, we learn every day this way. Uh, you know, our songs are so important to us. How often are we playing the drums and, and you know, and singing the songs? Yes, and we need to remember all traditional songs. And we are now, I just want to talk a little bit about, we have this Maridi party. It's, it's one week in during the years when we celebrate, we make ceremony, we eat together, we sing together, we discussion about what we we want and we players and we invite another another community and it's so important for us to feel this we need to feel this it, it's all it's our food you know it's who we are and we was the first one here in state of art to do this Maridi party and today so many people in tribe in Brazil they do the same because it's 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 magic it's all it's 
who we are in this planet. And it's so amazing how we can share, we can, we can see each other, we can talk in our language, we can, we can be who we are, we can be ourselves. And, and see our kids in this way is what we need to. And I remember when my grandfather tell me all this history. I remember when my father, because my grandfather this from his father and my he told for my father and today my father tell me and I will keep continuing to tell my kids and they they need to know how important it is for us our future. And I just want to tell about this this because I remember when when uh, you, know, you were talking about and I feel so I, I'm so emotional because it's it's it's, it's so amazing. You know, they, they do this thing uh, where you got to be careful who you marry, because if you if, if you marry somebody with a lot of brothers, they get to hit you with a banana leaf and it hurts. Um, it's, all, it's, all that <laughs> it's all love. But yeah, but it, it, there's this big ceremony and it's like a, a rite of passage that that they held on to and that has become so much stronger through the years um, where you know, you're dressing in paint and, and your traditional clothing and and you you enact this fight, this warrior fight, and and you and you really hit each other with these uh, the inner uh, stem of the banana leaf and it doesn't sound too bad, but trust me, <laughs> it's pretty pretty uh, pretty good. Um, and Sarah has what ten brothers, <laughs> fifteen brothers, yes. So uh, anyway, um, and, and, but it's beautiful. It's beautiful. And everybody circles around and all of her sisters and, and, and Sarah uh, come by my side. And, and, um, and then afterwards, we all dance together. And so it's a beautiful thing. And this is these types of things that, that, that we're missing in our lives and our in our day to day um, isolated families, isolated culture, isolated work structure you know we're not even working for our own communities we don't really know who we're working for in these in these corporation corporate world um you know this brings the communities together all of the communities of the Alanawa, all of the communities of the katakina come together to do this this uh party every year this celebration COVID obviously uh hurt that the last two years but but this is something that that is uh, a tradition that is amazing and and you know they talked about uh, I, I think we heard uh, about the powwows and stuff like that yeah the origins of the powwow kind of suck but the powwow itself brings our communities together and and helps us really bring our children into um, a pride in in who they are and, and their songs and their traditions and and their beadwork and I mean I'm wearing work right now this is this is uh very important you know these are these are our stories this it's this beadwork, yeah. yeah it all it's a protection when we when we when we have visitors in your land we say you need to use this first because it, you need to go protect it and it's they all have a mean they all has a uh mean meaning. meaning and yes each design yeah and each tribe has their own. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, thank you so much for ending on us on a note of joy and celebration. Um, and can we please show love and honor and respect to our amazing panelists in the chat? Um, so deeply grateful to all of you for this conversation, which it feels like we were really just beginning. Um, we're going to take a five minute stretch break. Um, but before we do, I just want to give you two quick logistical things. Um, if you can fill out the feedback form that we're going to be putting into the chat, that would be amazing. We really do take your feedback and try to make things even more meaningful. Um, and don't forget to check out the Padlet because a lot of the resources and links that our speakers have been talking about, you can find them there. So that's it for me. Love again to all of our panelists, and we'll see you in five.
Well, I was told that my cue was when the music's faded. And so I think that's when the music faded. Uh, welcome back, everyone. I'm Lisa Portes. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. I am zooming in from the land of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, the Adawa, and Potawatomi people, colonially known as Chicago. I am a five foot tall uh, Latina wearing a red sweater uh, with uh, silver earrings. And behind me is my office and a, uh, uh, a piece of woven art from the indigenous peoples of Colombia. Now I'm welcoming you back for three exciting reasons. The first is that I serve on TCG's board, and so I wanted to boost the call for nominations again for our new governance ecology. You'll see the links dropped into the chat momentarily, but if you have an interest in serving on the board, uh, this is a great way to get in. We have a, we have a brand new ecology, and, um, uh, and I think it's, it's, it's a really fantastic way to get involved with TCG and by TCG, through TCG to the larger field. The second exciting thing I get to do is ask you for money. So here's a slide that will take you to a couple of different ways you can do it. Now, my quick pitch is this. There are so many reasons to love TCG, right? There's TCG books and the new illumination series curated by Brandon Jacob Jenkins and featuring the classic works by black playwrights. There's the irreplaceable American theater magazine. I don't know, I have about 100, 200, maybe 300 stacked in my office. We've got grant and professional development programs like the Rising Leaders of Color, but more than anything, TCG acts on the most existential issues facing our field today. When the pandemic struck, TCG helped secure the largest federal investment in the arts since the WPA and convened public health experts to navigate each wave of the virus. Working with Jesse Cameron Alec and his collaborators, TCG recently hosted Emerging from the Cave, Artists Lead the Way, and is launching a new state of the artist project. This project will help move our field towards supporting artists upon whom our work depends, and yet who face so much precarity and inequity. And then there's the climate crisis. And that's where this gets even more personal for me. It's personal, first of all, because I'm on a break from rehearsing Caridad Switches Desdemona's Child, which is a climate play about a generation born into a world of past lies and rising waters. Sound familiar? It's personal because speaking of a generation seeking to reverse the damages of their forebears, I'm deeply inspired by the climate activism of my daughter, Eva Murillo, who is a Chicago leader in the Sunrise Youth Movement for Climate Change and the founder of the Sunrise Chicago High School Hub. I wonder what kind of world we are leaving for her and for her peers. And it's personal because this next session is a kind of Portes family or Portes family reunion as two of the brilliant speakers, this is insane, are my wonderful and real life cousins, Xavier Cortada and Ana Maria Claymeyer, whose work at the intersection of arts, civic policy and law blow me away every single and blessed day. So for all these reasons and more, I hope you'll support TCG. And now I'll turn it over to Devin and Big to kick off this Portes family reunion. Thank you so much, Lisa, just for your ongoing support of our, our climate action work at TCG. Um, and of course, the introductions. Uh, hi again, everyone. Um, Big and I are just going to offer some quick context for this next section and then turn the floor over to our wonderful speakers. Um, so this summit uh, is in December, partly in response to COP26, the big global UN climate summit uh, that was in November last month. COP26 is part of an ongoing decision making process uh, under the United Nations. Um, and also served as an accountability check-in for the nearly 200 countries who are members of the UN Climate Treaty and who participated in the Paris Agreement, which was adapted at COP21 in, in 2015. So we wanted to begin this conversation by drawing some lines between the Paris Agreement and our field. So the Paris Agreement uh, has three main goals that are summarized on this slide. And do you have the slides ready? Or do you want me to share my screen? Give me one moment, please. 
No worries. I will keep going. I'll verbalize those goals and the slides will catch up. Uh, great. So the goals are to maintain global temperature well below two degrees Celsius and preferably below, preferably below 1.5 uh, to increase global adaptation and develop resilience and to make finance flows basically consistent with these goals. So the Paris Agreement is global, uh, but it's implemented at the national level. Uh, part of the agreement requires countries to submit a statement outlining what they will do to help achieve the goals that I just mentioned. Um, and so on Earth Day of this year, the Biden administration announced a goal for the U.S. to meet our commitments, and in short, a 52% reduction by 2030. So today, we're focusing on two of those three Paris goals, the first and the third, and, and expanding on those ideas. And adaptation and resilience is an important part of the climate conversation, but today we are lifting the goal of drastically reducing emissions across every sector and the need to align our financial activities with that goal. And as we know, as storytellers, we hold even more power. Our art making, as we've been talking about, can shift our culture. So back to COP26. Uh, the stakes were really high at this COP because for more than four decades, the IPCC has been ringing alarm bells with their reports. Uh, like one of the most recent ones, it emphasizes that warming past that 1.5 will mean climate catastrophe, uh, locking the planet into increased climate volati volatility for the foreseeable future. But we do still have a small window of opportunity to avoid the worst case scenario for the human race after that, if we act wisely and if we act fast. So even as we've emerged from COP26, we're on track to warm the planet by 2.7 degrees Celsius or more, the effects of which are almost unthinkable. So hopefully by now you don't need convincing that this is an emergency and that we all have a role to play. But the Paris Agreement lifts other practices as important for realizing our goals, some of which as a field we should take note of. Collaboration and cooperation between countries, transparency of progress, climate education and awareness raising, capacity building and harnessing technology and taking action responsibly and in deference to local and indigenous knowledge, knowledge systems. So how do these concepts translate to our industry? Well, we need to work together to make enough progress. So we need to measure and message our progress transparently. We need to engage in raising awareness and capacity building around climate change. And we need to follow the lead of our local BIPOC leaders and the work they've been doing for years. So we're going into the how very soon. For now, I will hand the mic over to my partner, Big, who will tell us a little about how she translated global goals into footprint reducing, footprint reducing goals for TCG. Big. Thank you, Devin. Thank you so much. My name is Big Raksak Gongseng. My pronouns are she or they. I am in the grant making programs department at TCG, zooming in from the land of the Lenape people. My visual description, I am a Thai person with beautiful brown skin and black hair, wearing a gray shirt, sitting in front of a white wall. So back in 2019, I thought, sure, TCG will play a part in achieving the Paris Agreement goals. With power I had in my hand as an operations manager, I set a target for the TCG office to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by half by 2030. I calculated our current carbon footprint and searched for where we could cut down. Before COVID hit, I ran a calculation again and estimated that the TCG office had reduced our emissions by about 53%. I'm not going into the house here for the sake of time. I've put a summary of what TCG did on the Padlet, the amazing Padlet that we have. So feel free to peruse through in your own time. Well, climate change is a global concern. It is not a site specific issue to Turtle Island. Almost all of the top 10 countries that will be affected most by sea level rising aren't even top greenhouse gas contributors. My home country, Thailand, is among the top 10. So I'm passionate as much as angry when it comes to climate justice, to the point that I have to co-chair this summit. It's high time we look beyond borders to think global and act local. 
act, if not for your older self, then for your younger ones. So before we go into the space for action and collective commitment, today we are graciously joined by two amazing speakers who have worked on climate, climate issues at an international level and attended COP26. If you have any questions for the speakers, please put your questions in the chat. If, you have, if we have time, we will take one or two questions at the end. So please welcome Anna Maria Klemeyer, a climate attorney to the UN who has represented Argentina and Micronesia, and Xavier Cortada, an artist and a professor of practice at the University of Miami. Thank you, big. Greetings, everyone. Buenos dias, bonjour. I hope everybody is doing well. I hope that you are safe. I hope that you are warm. I hope that you are protected by the home where you live or the space that you inhabit. These are things that I wish for everyone in the world and things we often take for granted, but they are the essence of what is at risk for many people in the world, including many people in our country. And We've heard about some of, some of those. I'm here today uh, zooming in from, from the Chesapeake Bay, the land of the Pescadue people, colonially known as Alexandria, Virginia. And I'm so excited to be here. I'm really, really, it's really such a pleasure. I really, I'm, I'm sort of happy beyond words to be speaking to this community because um, in, in, the, in, in the deepest part of my heart and soul, I believe that this challenge of climate change cannot be solved without artists and the artistic community that can catalyze the change that we need to see in the world. I've been invited to tell you a little bit about the experience of, of the Conference of the Parties or the COPs as, as they're known. I'm a lawyer um, by day and an artist and musician by night. Um, and, and I've spent um, yeah, many years working on, on this issue. Um, so I'm gonna just kind of give you a little bit of an overview. Devin has, uh, has done a great um, kickoff. Uh, I'm gonna go a little bit more into depth and then I'm going to, um, to talk uh, with, well, sort of start the conversation and uh, first introducing um, my cousin, Xavier Cortada but also opening your minds and your hearts to think about um, in what way uh, can you uh, contribute and activate yourself, your life, your talents, um, your community to participate as much as possible in um, helping the world to address this problem. So I'm going to try to share my screen. Um, here we go. There we are. So just an overview of the treaty, um, a few takeaways from the COP, and then a little bit about where we can go from here. Um, just in a nutshell, and I'm not going to read out everything on the screen, but um, the, the, the countries of the world as a global community have been working on climate change uh, for, for many years, for nearly 50 years on environmental issues more broadly, but also on the um, issue of climate change. And it was back in 1992 that, um, that countries gathered in Rio, Brazil, and they uh, agreed to a number of really important environmental treaties. These are global agreements that countries sign up to. So the governments themselves have a legal responsibility to fulfill the treaties. Um, one of those treaties was the, was the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Um, the, where was this born? Did it just come out of nowhere? Well, no, in fact, um, just as today, the scientists are our guiding light on what is happening in terms of climate change and how we can participate. Um, back in the 1970s and 80s, there was a community of, of scientists from around the world called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, oftentimes referred to because it's a, it's a long and uh, awkward uh, phrase. It's they're oftentimes just referred to as the IPCC. And these scientists, they 
publish a report about every five or six years. It's not the most cutting edge because it takes them that long to, to come to consensus globally. And that report drives our decisions, our being the, the, the countries that attend these conferences, they drive the decisions forward because every time they tell us something new and they, and they stress more and more about the urgency of climate change and give us greater depth of knowledge on what the causes are, what the impacts will be. And it's taken a very, very long time, as you can see, many, many decades since the, since the crisis was identified to where we are today um, at a point where still, despite a lot of, a lot of great, uh, let's say greater attention to the issue, there's still not quite enough being done. The other thing that the scientists have told us and that is important when we think about this, you know, this, the, the, the global conference and also our role is they, they, they give us um, updated reports on uh, what exactly, where exactly is the root of this problem. And you see this weird spaghetti thing that I'm showing here. And basically this is a, a, a crazy, but fairly accurate uh, d description of all of the different sources of greenhouse gases. Um, and where they come from. And if you just give, give it a quick look, what you'll probably notice is that so many things in our daily lives contribute to climate change. Basically, um, everything that we, that we do contributes in, in one way or another. Um, the upside of that is that there are many opportunities for engagement in trying to reduce the, 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 the emissions from these sectors. So this climate convention that started back in 1992, um, it has 197 member states. That's basically every country in the world. Um, it's an international treaty, which means that the countries had to uh, formulate it, then sign up to it. And once they signed up, they basically uh, became members of this club that, uh, that agreed to certain principles about what they, were, what they were going to do collectively, cooperatively, Devin used that word, and it's a really important word in the international negotiations, cooperation on climate change. Um, they, uh, the, the original treaty was quite broad. And so in 2015, the countries got together again and they said, all right, we need, we need some more specificity. We have to do more. The problem is becoming ever more urgent. And so they agreed to this, uh, this new piece of the convention called the Paris Agreement. It's kind of under the umbrella of this bigger convention. And the Paris Agreement, Devin pointed out some of those important pieces of the Paris, um, of the Paris Agreement. But one of the most important things that the agreement did was that it, um, it told parties that they would have to pledge their actions, their specific actions and targets on climate change, both on the mitigation or reduction of the gases, but also on the side of adaptation and implementation. What exactly are you going to do? Um, and it, if you're curious, it's pretty easy to find the, these, these nationally determined contributions, as they're called, NDCs. Um, if you're curious about one country or another, maybe someplace you've been or someplace that you're fun, from, you can find those NDCs online and see what, um, what, what a different, you know, different countries have committed to. The United States has an NDC, of course, as well. However, what's really important um, from our perspective as normal people, not as the governors of countries, is that um, the pledges, if you add them all together, and scientists and economists have, they've added up all of, all of the promises from countries, and they find that even if every country does everything they say they're going to do, we're still on track for 2.7 degrees Celsius of warming, which is about mm, like closer to like four and a half degrees Fahrenheit of warming. Now that doesn't mean every place in the world will warm exactly four and a half degrees, but it does mean, you know, some places will warm more and others will warm less, but it does put at risk some critical parts of the world like the Arctic, um, the glaciers from around the world on which we depend not only for water, but also for the stability of our oceans, et cetera. So basically it's not good news that we're on a 2.7 degree Celsius path. We need to help change that. 
And uh, that's what we'll talk about in a minute. How can, how can we as citizens um, of our country help affect um, a, uh, affect this, the ultimate goal and the implementation of this convention. But one thing I wanted to point out before we get to the, what can we do, is why, do, why are we cooperating um, as countries together on this issue? And the reason is that climate change is essentially a, um, uh, an environmental and economic problem that, that knows no borders, right? So um, the emissions that are released on one side of the planet cause changes in the atmosphere that affect everywhere and anywhere in, in the world. And the other reason is that the countries and the people and the communities that contribute the least to greenhouse gases are the ones that will suffer the most. And the reason for that is that those communities are the poorer communities or those who, who um, who live most in equilibrium with nature. And those communities tend to be more vulnerable to, to uh, the impacts of climate change, the droughts, the floods, the extreme weather events. They don't have the resiliency and the protection that um, the more industrialized countries and communities have to protect them from these changes that are coming. So there's a recognition in the climate convention that first of all, the industrialized countries will take the lead on the greatest amount of action because they recognize that they are contributing and have contributed the most. And second, that they will help developing countries, especially the most vulnerable of those countries and communities like small island states and least developed countries, they will help them to adapt to climate change, and they will also help them get on track with a more climate-friendly, resilient um, future. So I just wanna, I'll, I'm gonna just touch on quickly on the, in the climate COP, what does it look like there? You have your negotiators and the negotiations um, happening in uh, some rooms, but there are all of these observers who, um, who attend, and those are, um, you know, basically people from all walks of life interested in climate change. Um, those observers provide accountability. They help exchange information and experience and find solutions to climate change. They report to the world. They have a lot of responsibilities. And they range from youth, indigenous people, artists, industry um, uh, people. It's really kind of every, everything that you could possibly imagine and the kitchen sink. Um, uh, there's only about two or 3,000 um, negotiators who attend the COP and about 8,000 people um, who are not negotiators who attend. This is a little bit of what it looks like. So I just wanna, um, I talked a little bit about this, you know, that there's sort of an, uh, an, uh, a, a, a connection between those who are impacted, those who contribute, et cetera. But now I wanna talk a moment about um, you know what can we what can we do as as citizens, um, and uh, and this will be a segue into our next speaker. So the way that I look at my role as a, as a human being on the planet is that I have a lot of um, uh, a lot of influence over my own decisions over myself, but that influence only has a certain amount of impact. In, uh, in terms of climate change or in terms of anything that I wanna change at a global scale. Um, but when I work within my community, I have more um, influence uh, and impact. Maybe I can't convince everyone in my community to do everything that I, would, that I would do, but I can through my example and through education and through inspiration, I can, um, I can catalyze more support um, and then through that larger uh, influence, I can have more impact on the decision makers in the political level, right? And that's how we connect up to, to uh, processes like the COP is that um, from our own daily lives, through our communities, into our influence um, of our governments, then when our governments show up to, uh, to um, to meet and discuss with other countries, they have the force of our intention behind them. And um, I believe 
that art and artists are the energy that connect the individual through the community to that greater level. And we do that because we can inspire and we can help um, uh, inform people in a way that, that really goes deep into the fabrics of our lives, of our souls, and of, um, of the way that we engage with those around us. Um, and there's no one uh, that I know better um, in the world who does this, uh, who uses artwork to, to inspire and connect these three spheres than um, Xavier Cortada. Um, he happens to be uh, my cousin and, uh, uh, and that's a great coincidence, but we've been collaborating also for many years on, um, on environmental and climate change issues. So it's a real pleasure to introduce him now and I'll turn it over to him and let him tell you about his work. Thank you so much, Ana Maria. I love that we are doing our um, family reunion here in front of everyone else, which is awesome. Anyway, I, I know we're short in time, so I'm really gonna rush uh, through this so that we can uh, engage with one uh, another. So I'm sharing my screen now. Um, oh gosh, hold on, slideshow, play from start. Hi everyone, it's my pleasure to be here. And I am here uh, with, a sense of urgency, a sense of urgency because if we fail to act, everything that you love is at stake. Every ecosystem, animals within those ecosystems, the waters, humans, humans not yet born, and the organizations like nation states that um, are organized as societies to protect those humans and those ways of life. All of that, every single thing of it is at stake. This picture here is Miami. It's actually a photograph taken at the dry valleys in Antarctica, but that is landing here. This is where I live. This is my home and sea level rise threatens to impact us because Miami is flat. Our highest point is 24 feet above sea level. I live, this room that I am sitting in is six feet above sea level. In the past, I've tried tackling sea level the way you would track any hostile takeover. Unfortunately, I must apologize. I did resort to violence. So I tried hitting the water, but that didn't work. Again, violence only begets violence. So instead, I decided to freeze those very glaciers that were melting in Miami and, and threatening to drown Miami. I, I thought, my gosh, if this water that's coming into my living room, this water that is putting salt water into my freshwater aquifer was once frozen ice, then I can just refreeze it. But of course, I realized the futility in that because the refrigerator would only emit more greenhouse gases that would melt more glaciers that would cause a problem. So I did what every politician does. I decided to dig a hole in the sand, but unlike politicians, I did not shove my head in the sand. Instead, I decided to take the entirety of the Atlantic Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico and put it underground, right? The idea is to keep the water below the ground. And I got really tired, I got exhausted. So I thought I needed other people to help me. I went back and used those images of the art pieces I created with the very art, the very ice that threatens to melt my city. And I decided to create these ice paintings capturing the bullet, the precursor of the horrors to come. So these ice paintings I've used over the years, I created them back in 2007, but for COP26, I decided to use them as a way of engaging the audiences at COP26. And I wanted to create an art piece where instead of us seeing each other as individuals, we would see each other with our vulnerabilities, with our fears, our hopes, and our shared goals. So the idea is as the little ice painting, the background melts, the sea level rises, and when it rises to your elevation, your community suffers. Here's a quick little video of what we did at COP26. The idea was, thank you, Mayor. So as you go to Glasgow, I know that you will be 
I know that you will be sharing all the wisdom and her stories, but also sharing our elevation. Thank you so much. I'm relatively high at seven feet, Daniela. Thank you so much, Mayor. The idea was to let Miamians in Miami-Dade County understand that what was happening at COP26, 4,000 miles away in Scotland, mattered to them, that it was relevant. The decision made by these nations, by these parties at this conference would impact Miami the same way it would impact Micronesia and the same way it would impact everywhere where land touches water, but not just where land touches water, but the thriving ecosystems that need the climate that has evolved the living beings and living systems today to continue. As you know, warming climate impacts all of us. A weakened Gulf Stream that would be caused with the incredible melting of Greenland would wreak havoc across our entire world, specifically across Europe. The destruction of the sea ice in the Arctic would cause jet streams that would wreak havoc across all of our planet and of course within our country. The droughts that would come, the stronger, wetter, slower hurricanes caused by heat being trapped in our waters, again, because of the human impacts, the greenhouse gases, the carbon footprint that we, every one of your theater goers, every one of your board members, every one of your actors, every one of your playwrights contributes into the atmosphere would spell catastrophe to every human not yet born for the next millennia if we continue doing this and putting it at two degrees, three degrees, and even four degrees above the pre-industrial averages. So this is a world problem. It is an existential crisis, and it is a reason why artists are needed to be able to take really complex ideas, ideas that are hard to solve, and have us find ways of reimagining, of rethinking how it is that we as a society could come together and address the issue. And the issue is hard and it is particularly hard when you think of yourself as individual nation states, as you think about your own personal or economic interest. And that's why it's important to help use art to reframe the way we think, not as individuals with rugged individualisms, but as a collective, not as politicians thinking as nation states, but thinking in a planetary context. And again, it's by building constituencies, movements, individuals who see ourselves as having a shared future based on our current action that we get to do something. And nowhere more than theater. Nowhere more than in your ability to work not as a painter alone in a studio, but in an industry, in a field, in a practice, in an art form that by its very nature necessitates interdisciplinarity and has broad audiences that appeal to massive, massive sectors of our society, and that has a huge carbon footprint, can we begin to make a difference? And our plea today is for you as the cultural leaders of the United States and de facto environmental cultural leaders by your very participation in this conference, take action to effectuate change. And as Ana Maria said, it could be as simple. Here I am by myself talking to a tree as a performance art piece in the middle of negotiation, trying to tell that tree that what these guys were trying to do was something that it does inherently, which is to take carbon out of the atmosphere. I later tried to rescue that tree, but the bureaucracy allowed that tree to die. So I gave it its last rites. You can read all about that. I'm sure in the chat links that you are uh, being given, but again, it's a, it's a way for an artist to use this medium that helps us imagine, engage, reframe, rethink how we problem solve. And that's something that I as an artist have been doing in my practice, whether the slide on the left, I put an iceberg big piece of ice and have it melt in my beautiful opening because Antarctica doesn't care about your timeline. It's working on its, or you have children 
take the property records of their parents' homes and create an underwater flotilla because those property values are gonna be underwater if we continue polluting and putting carbon into the atmosphere. Or airplanes made of utility bills because our fossil fuel-based economy, our utilities that use fossil fuels continue going high, 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 not just in their costs, but also in their polluting and destructive effects, something that we as a society continue to subsidize through our tax dollars. And one of the two things we're trying to solve here through our investments. That needs to end artists, you, we, need to show society a better way, a way to transform that. And again, collective collaborative thinking is a way for us to get there. That is what I saw at COP26. What happened inside COP26 was really important. But you know what? The 130,000 people I marched with across the streets of Glasgow during the conference and those youth that managed to be inside also had impact. And it's that kind of impact that we as a society need to have and that each of us through our own cultural institutions can bring and do so in the next 11 months as we approach COP27, when all these nation states will once again come together and perhaps this time do more than what Greta accused them of doing, which was blah, blah, blah not doing enough and not taking the urgency of the moment. In the future, every single one of us will come to understand that climate is to us what tech is today. You could have not imagined 10, 15 years ago that everything we do is so dominated by technology, whether it's education or grocery shopping, that technology is immersed in every aspect of our lives. Well, just like that, climate will be involved in every single thing we do, and especially as the world suffers in the arts. And I challenge us to be able to walk the walk before we talk the talk. We will have a responsibility to program culturally, program content that addresses climate more and more than we do so today. Let our board members create sustainable organizations. Let that organization model behavior across the community and be open and in fact serve as a catalyst, an incubator so that more cultural programming happens, not just in the state, in the stage, on the stage, but across the community. Unleash yourselves, become agents of change, and use the very power of your craft to transform the planet. And give yourselves a goal. What will each of us do in the next 12 months when there are hundreds of people, hundreds of thousands of people marching across the planet asking for each of these nation states to keep us under 1.5 degrees Celsius. What will each of us do to contribute to that discussion? I believe in the capacity and the ability of our theater community to be among the loudest and more persuasive voices at the US. As we prepare for COP27, let's each of us do our part. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, so, so much for these just hugely important insights, uh, Ana Maria into COP26 and the, this like level of global, global climate work that seems so far away from so many of us and Xavier for your incredibly powerful art and words. We have so much gratitude uh, to both of you for joining us. Um, so this is actually, friends, where we say goodbye to our live stream friends, our friends on HowlRound, and hello to